Okay, I'm here with John today and we're going to be talking about the environmental benefits of range extended electric vehicles. Uh, John, why don't you introduce yourself here to the... Sure, my name is John Colo and I'm a former nuclear engineer and chemist aboard ballistic missile submarines. I also worked in industry and high technology for over 30 years. Okay, and you're, so you're not a trucker and this is the interesting thing. So you come all the way up from the east coast of the U.S. I'm from the southeast of the United States and drove 2,700 miles. 2,700 miles to get here, not a trucker. And so what brought you to be interested in the Edison project? Because I'm massively interested in climate change and solutions to the problem. So what about Edison kind of, what part of the climate change solution attracted you to us? Because heavy transport accounts for a very large percentage of emissions. And so if you can affect solutions or change in that small uh, segment, it's gonna have outsized benefits. Okay. And I believe in Edison's approach to doing that. As opposed to some of the other ones, like there's fully electric, there's hydrogen for all these zero tailpipe emissions vehicles. So mm -hmm. what is it about the range extended electric approach that works for you? Because each one of the other solutions that are out there, um, they all come with some, uh, some compromises. And the way that I look at it is the range extended electric platform from Edison Motors, that approach um, offers all the solutions with none of the compromises. No? Okay, so, well, let's walk us through there. So for fully electric, what do you think, like fully electric, no emissions, what do you view as some of the main problems with just fully electric, BEV? I, yeah, I think the, the, the there's three major problems with battery electric uh, as the sole solution for um, moving a heavy duty truck. Um, one of them is cost. So these, these vehicles cost anywhere from two to three times a traditional um, diesel vehicle. And so operators and, 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 and fleets are gonna balk at that high additional cost. Um, and then there's things that a lot of people overlook or just kind of put in the background or don't know enough about. But uh, we have two major problems in the world, the US and Canada in particular. Uh, we don't have enough grid capacity and enough, not enough grid capacity expansion is coming online in time, uh, in a timely manner. And the second one is um, charging infrastructure. A lot of people think about a battery electric vehicle, and that's fine if, if we're buying a Tesla or a Volt for our for our own use in our homes. We're going to charge slow overnight in our garage or in our driveway. But when you buy a heavy duty electric truck, you have to buy the gas station that goes along with it, not just the truck. And so in addition to the cost of a truck, you have about one and a half times more of an investment that has to be made in the charging infrastructure. You have to put a, it would be like a Tesla owner having to put a fast charger in his Yes, in his garage. Instead of a level and one nobody's going to do two. that. Right. It's expensive. It is. Especially when you start looking at multiple trucks. Now you've got a whole fleet of 20, 30 trucks, right. all of them needing a fast charger. Right. All of those costing almost as much as the truck does. Mm -hmm. And when you charge them all at night, as an example, if you charged 10 battery electric vehicle, heavy duty uh, trucks at a megawatt uh, rate overnight, that's the equivalent of 8,000 US households, 10 large hospitals, or a, a, a game stadium on Super Bowl Sunday, all at once. 10 trucks. 10 trucks. Is the equivalent of a Super Bowl mm -hmm. stadium yep. on game day. And now when you power. take and when you take into consideration just let's just look at realities because it's a little less than for the people in the states watching it's a little less than 50 degrees today in Canada. But over the last week in Texas the Texas governor declared a state of emergency and encouraged energy reductions so that the grid didn't collapse under cooling loads because of the high temperatures in Texas. So what are we going to do if we have thousands of trucks that all need to be charged in order to keep the economy running when we can't keep the grid operating with just the normal loads that we have today that we all know are going to continue to increase with population growth? I don't think people realize how much power a truck 
actually uses. Mm -hmm. 10 trucks as much as a Super Bowl. Uh, a trucking company can have 30 trucks. A small trucking company can add. That would be like running three Super Bowls every single day, every day. in every little town. Yep. And it's all going to be... Trucks normally get off work around 4, 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Same as any other job, like for the local vocational guys. And that means that it's going to be hitting the grid at peak at, at times. Peak demand. People are cooking dinner, turning down the thermostats, running, um, doing clothes, you know, um, taking baths, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we really don't. We haven't invested in our electrical grid. And the problem is you're not seeing the investment in our grid in renewable power. And that, like, that's great if it can come from hydro. I was doing the math. And if you look at Site C Dam and the size of that site, you would need another eight Site C dams just to meet the grid capacity of just logging trucks in the province. Mm -hmm. You would have to flood an area almost the size of Wales to produce that hydroelectric power. Right. Now, if you do solar, we don't approve the environmental permits, which means the best case you got natural gas peaker plants coming mm -hmm. online and then you still have the issues with methane and natural gas mm -hmm. so that's not really zero emissions to go full electric or then you're in the u.s and then you got to put in more coal plants as a case of germany and bring or coal plants or, na or yeah natural gas but here's here's where the rubber meets the road as it relates to a battery electric vehicle versus an all extend a range extended electric platform is that it's actually we know that if we were to put renewable fuels in an extended range electric. What's renewable fuels? So we'll get into that in a second, but renewable, if we put renewable fuels in, in a range extended electric, then that is actually doing more to curb greenhouse gas emissions and affect climate change than a battery electric vehicle that's charged using a natural gas fired a uh, grid. So renewable diesel is renewable diesel is one. Renewable natural gas is another. Um, and then there's a lot of hype going around with with, with hydrogen. Um, we're bullish on hydrogen here. Um, I'm bullish on hydrogen. It's like nuclear fusion. It's 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 clean. Um, it's abundant. It's it's a solution, but it's a future solution. We don't currently have a whole bunch of things that are needed for hydrogen to be the solution today. Well, what is wrong with hydrogen? Like you hear hydrogen and we've even had companies approach Edison to say, hey, would you be interested in pulling out the diesel and putting in a hydrogen? I, I don't mind it. I, I think there are some advantages. I think the technology is a long way off. I wouldn't research my own hydrogen, but if somebody in the future had a hydrogen fuel cell that worked, I wouldn't be opposed to trying it. What's your... There's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with the technology itself. It's just very expensive. It hasn't scaled. Hydrogen has its own particular issues worth of, you know, issues. Um, Actually, but, I wish I could say how expensive it is. We got an NDA on the hydrogen, but it's, I can't say exactly how much because it's covered under the NDA. I wouldn't look at it as a reasonable way of doing it until that cost comes down. The, co the cost of everything associated with hydrogen has to come down. The cost of production, producing the hydrogen have to come down. The cost of the hydrogen fuel cells have to come down. And then the cost of hydrogen itself has to come down. And when we talk about the cost of hydrogen, there's financial costs and there's environmental costs. And today, to put hydrogen as a solution, the way that we are producing, transporting, and burning hydrogen today, uh, it's approximately 23% efficient. And we can be massively more efficient than that using renewable diesel in an uh, range extended all electric. Okay, what is renewable diesel? So renewable diesel comes from renewable feedstocks and they are from, uh, they're byproducts from food processing like fish fats as an example. Uh, but the most common one that people can probably relate to is they can only fry so many um, uh, pounds of fries in the McDonald's vat before they have to put it out and they're not allowed to put it down the drain. It has to be commercially disposed of. And so there are production capacity, there's production facilities all around the country and the world, and it's increasing at an increasing rate where those uh, feedstocks are coming back in and then they're being, cre they're being distilled 
to be a, a, a drop-in replacement for petrodiesel. Hmm. It's exactly the and same. And then how does the emissions, how is that different now from normal diesel? Because renewable diesel burns hotter and cleaner. So you're getting now towards the natural gas argument. But then why. you don't, natural gas though, it problem is it does burn hotter, but it doesn't have the lubricity in the, your engine to... And, and, and renewable diesel doesn't have any of those inherent problems. Even though it burns hotter. It, it burns cleaner. It burns cleaner, not necessarily hotter. Okay. Okay, but it has similar lubricity, lubrication qualities yeah. to petrodiesel. So why are we doing more biodiesel then? Or renewable not, not, not bio. Not bi renewable. Bio ha is, is another one. Bio comes from uh, biological sources. Uh, and there's a couple of problems with biodiesel that are, we just don't need to get into. Um, the best of all worlds is actually to have blends of petrodiesel, renewable diesel, and biodiesel. That's how we get down to the least um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and tailpipe emissions, down to particulates. Okay, yeah. well then how does, if we're just looking from emission, emissions point, mm -hmm. how does a range extended diesel electric truck compare emission wise to just a natural gas or pure battery truck from well to tail pipe. To wheel, to wheel, well to wheel. Yeah, no right. tailpipe on an electric, right? Well to wheel. Um, so that's a great question because that takes into consideration the entire lifespan of, or the life cycle of the fuel from the time that it is pulled out of the ground or otherwise produced to the time that it's burned or you know makes wheels turn, right? Um, so if we use renewable diesel, we're going to get an and we're going to get an economy increase because it's a it's a it's a better burning fuel. So your fuel consumption overall is going to go down. And then when you look at the ecological standpoints uh, uh, benefits, then you have um, less emissions that are coming out of that burn as well. Now, when you couple that with, and this is the important part from an Edison perspective that I hope that people come away with an understanding of, is the best diesel is 40 to 45 percent efficient. An average electric drivetrain is 90 to 95 percent efficient. So if I just look at units of energy that are used, I'm converting much more of the electric propulsion to horsepower and torque to the wheels than I am with, a, with an all diesel vehicle. Okay, so we're going from a 40 to a 45 percent to a 90 to a 95 percent. And then when I couple that or combine that with a seven to a 10 percent fuel uh, consumption reduction on the, on the engine itself, the diesel itself, now I have a massively different and better picture than any of the solutions that are out there. So instead of just having the diesel, you get better fuel economy with the diesel with the, electric. With the, with the renewable diesel, you get better economy. Better fuel economy, with and then you have better diesel. efficiency using the electric drivetrain than using a diesel petrol yeah. drivetrain. A couple of the fuel, the efficiencies of a generator, one peak RPM, mm -hmm. coupled with the hybrid. You start the day with a full charge. You can mm -hmm. plug it in, and now you get to some of the other benefits. Um, there's a pretty respected um, freight system hauler down in down in the states. Um, they've cited you know, three times more expensive for the battery electric um, uh, heavy duty trucks. Uh, and they're reserving them only for short haul because they can only get 150 miles out of them. Um, meanwhile, with the rest of their fleet, which is all petrodiesel, they're able to work those trucks 600 miles a day on two shifts. Whereas so, this, we could work 20, this truck could work 24 hours a day, absolutely. as long as there's fuel in the tanks. Mm -hmm. The cost is definitely not three times the cost of a normal diesel because right. we have small, the batteries are the most expensive thing because we're range extended. We can have small batteries. They're really there for mm -hmm. peak load demand. They're mm -hmm. not designed to get a truck through a whole day. Right. Brings the cost down, brings down the amount of lithium mining you have to do. It brings down the cost of everything. 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 That's why this is the optimum solution for heavy duty trucks and electrifying this sector. Mm -hmm. And then... Kind of last but not least, other than the different types of all the features and benefits of that range extended electric platform, when I look at Edison Motors, you have a twofold opportunity. You have the ability to build custom heavy duty vocational service trucks for customers. Probably more important to me than that is the prospect of being able to produce retrofit kits. 
so that all of those trucks that don't have that many miles on the roads, but they're not going to be able to continue to um, uh, meet or exceed, well, just meet emissions requirements and standards. Uh, if you look at cities, they're doing it more abroad. You can't drive into the center of London with a with, with, with a diesel vehicle anymore. Yeah, they're starting to do that in the ports here. And there's and they're and it's going to just it's just going to continue to happen more and more. So, you know, would I rather be able to uh, start pouring concrete, um, you know, way before we can do it today because I've got a silent drivetrain because I'm all electric? Do I want to be able to go into a construction an urban construction zone? and be noise and vibration free because I'm not, you know, uh, doing a diesel. Do I want to be able to take advantage of regenerative braking and charge my batteries while I go downhill without blowing the eardrums out of everybody that I pass by with a Jake brake? There's so many different benefits. And when I can take a retrofit kit and now I can put that in a vehicle that's got 70,000 miles, 100,000 miles, heck, even 500,000 miles, and I can double the lifespan of that truck. And you can take a vehicle with 3 million miles. It don't matter. The frame sure. rails are good. Sure. As, lo as long as that chassis rolls, yeah. I can breathe new life into it with an old, with a range-extended electric retrofit kit. Although, I agree with everything, except for one point you said there. Okay. One point I've got a hard disagreement with is how you said that you could have the quiet regenerative braking. I still like the sound of the jake brakes. The, a, my biggest you lack said of... in the beginning, you're a trucker. I'm I not. know, <laughs> but like the, the worst thing about electric is it doesn't do the sound as you're coming and down. I, no. And I know you like it. It's the best sound. Non-truckers don't, but not is, so much. <laughs> this is kind of what's cool. So like when we started Edison, I started this because I wanted a really reliable, like it, the huge horsepower, the torque of the electric, the decreased fuel mileage, were all the things that sold me on the diesel electric. Increased fuel mileage. Did I, what did I say? Decreased fuel In consumption. Decreased fuel, yeah. The, b better fuel. That, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> better fuel. <laughs> so those are the things that really sold me on the electric. The power, the reliability of the electric, the no plant obsolescence, and repairability. Then repairability. All of those things really sold me on the electric. And then John drives 2,600 miles up from the southern coast of the United States to tell us that what we're doing is environmentally good. And I think that's kind of cool. And I kind of wanted to share that with you that this actually has the lowest emissions well to wheel. Yes. That's cool. We have one of the most emissions friendly vehicles while trying to make the most powerful horsepower and most economically to drive vehicles. And it's just kind of a cool combination here. And the last point I would make is that while we've talked about renewable diesel in this particular prototype, uh, production prototype, this is a future ready vehicle. So whether it's uh, another advanced fuel or alternative fuel, or whether it's natural gas that somebody wants to burn, or whether fuel cells really do decrease in cost and hydrogen production becomes cleaner, this vehicle and this drive train and this powertrain, this Range extended electric platform is ready for that. Yeah, we could. It, it don't matter. The, the truck don't give a shit whether it's got a fuel cell, natural gas generator, warehouser wanted us to look at a propane generator. No, oh, I don't. Know. Okay. It don't matter. A logging company. This is, that is, I will not have mentioned two seconds ago. <laughs> wanted us to put in a propane generator. Oh, they were already at the shop. We we told everyone. Okay. But yeah, they were talking about propane, natural gas, fuel cell. Hell, if battery technology and grid capacity exist, and you have one of these trucks, 10, 15 years, and we do bring up the grid capacity. You could rip that diesel generator out and you could put in more batteries. You could rip that diesel exactly. generator out, you could put in fuel cells. It, it, could, it, don't could, it, could, it could even be a full-on BEV. Right. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't matter. You can change up. As long as you have the E-axles and the batteries to give you some peak load demand, yeah. run whatever you want. So to go back to the question of why did I drive as far as I did to come up here to help you guys get this ready for fully charged live is because I'm a huge believer in the approach. I like Chase, and I particularly really want Edison Motors to succeed. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John.